Many of you know about an Aussie animated TV series called Bluey, set in a city based on Brisbane. There are so many reasons why this show has risen to worldwide popularity, but one thing it's often praised for is its depiction of parents who don't abide by their gender stereotypes. Take this clip for example. Oh, Oh no, a guinea pig has escaped. What? Yeah, 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 come back here, guinea pig. You have to push his nose to turn him off. But how? While other cartoons might portray dads as the clueless beer-bellied guy who just wants to watch TV, Bluey's dad, Bandit, is active in his children's playtime and often takes the lead in creating fun adventures for his kids. People have observed that not only does Bluey rewrite the gender script, but it also models healthy gender roles not only to kids, but to parents as well. Both of those two things relate to the cognitive and social learning theories of gender formation, which is what we'll be exploring in this lesson. Let's start with the cognitive theories. Lawrence Kohlberg was an eminent American psychologist who came up with various explanations for stages of cognition, predominantly around moral development. Cognitive psychologists, you may remember, study the relationship between our thought processes and the behavior that we present. But Kohlberg also proposed a cognitive theory of gender, proposing that children go through three stages, gender identity, gender stability, and gender constancy. According to Kohlberg, the gender identity stage occurs at around two to three years of age, where the child recognizes and starts to label themselves as a boy or a girl. The child might also start to associate some behaviors or attributes with a specific gender or sex, but doesn't really have any stable concept about it, not really knowing where it came from or what might happen to it. At three to four years of age, Kohlberg suggests that the child then goes through a stage called gender stability, where they start to recognize that their sex will not change over time, but they still don't really fully grasp the difference between sex and gender. For example, if their dad suddenly wore a dress, they might say that he is now a woman. And then finally, from about five years of age onwards, Kohlberg would say that children reach a stage called gender constancy, where they realize that sex is a fixed state that will not change. And that even if someone's appearance or behavior changes, it doesn't suddenly make them a member of the opposite sex. It's a remarkably insightful observation that he made and actually a pretty fun thing to try out uh, with little siblings or cousins that you may have around these ages. The second cognitive theory that's been proposed to explain why we seem to have these gender roles uh, has to do with gender schemas, which are a pattern of thinking or a set of beliefs. The idea here is that once a child realizes that they fit into either the boy or girl category, they start learning about what makes that group unique and start forming a schema. A boy will seek information about being a man and a girl about being a woman. Another way of describing this is that the child subconsciously starts to develop their own gender script. These scripts will help children decide how they should behave and predict how someone else will behave. Here's an example. If this is the environment in which a child grows up, which admittedly is very strange, uh, the gender script that she might start to develop as she watches this fake TV is that women should do the housework women should look pretty, men should go to work, and men should just relax at home. Uh, and obviously women should also be insanely strong because it looks like she's supporting the couch with like two fingers. She is built. On the other hand, a show like Bluey might introduce to kids a different gender script. By observing the characters, they might start to think that subconsciously, women and men can both go to work, uh, women and men can both help out around the house, and men can be great at playing with kids too. As children get older, these gender scripts and schemas that they have become less and less malleable, and we even start to ignore things that contradict it. Gender schema theory explains why gender roles are stable in society and rarely change after middle childhood. However, it doesn't take into account the social and cultural factors that influence gender role formation. So you may remember from a previous lesson that one of the main forms of learning is social learning, you know, watching and imitating role models. Well, seeing gender role formation through that lens is our third and final theory. So assuming that boys and girls are completely the same from birth, this approach suggests that all gendered behavior is learned as a child simply by socialization and observation. So girls are more likely to copy their moms and boys are more likely to copy their dads. Of course, we also said that people are more likely to imitate people they look up to. And so friends, even some teachers, and especially the media is very influential in providing gender role models for kids. And if we're honest, for us still. 
But another way that gender roles can be formed via social learning is vicariously, again, as we've learned before. That is, when we observe someone else get rewarded or punished for a behavior. So for example, a young girl may witness her older sister being told how pretty she looks in a dress, or being told that she shouldn't want to play footy. And she learns, well, I guess you get rewarded for being pretty and punished for showing stereotypically male behavior. In 1985, Margaret Fugot found that children sometimes act as gender police for each other and will actually be critical of their peers who act in ways that are too much like the opposite gender. Um, Eccles would also later find that the way teachers give praise is often influenced by the gender of the student. Girls were more praised for their obedience and being tidy, while boys were more likely to be praised for academic achievements. It's something I was taught in, t in teacher school, and while I still have to be careful not to lapse into typical norms, I do also think that things have improved in school somewhat. So that's our three theories of gender role formation. Which one of these is the best explanation? All of them, and maybe none of them? I mean, these are simply three ways of understanding something quite complex, and it could be that the truth lies in a blend of all three. It's also worth saying that psychology doesn't actually tell us what's right. That category is mostly outside the realm of science. But I did want to say that if you feel convicted to go against societal norms to make the world a fairer place for all sexes and genders, that does seem like a right thing to do. We've seen that males and females are so similar and different at the same time, and maybe the unity and diversity are both things we should celebrate. All right, that brings us to the end of this one big objectives. See you in the next one where I'll cover group social influence.